contribution of religion in the public sphere, 10 minutes, Imran. Um, <clears throat> I won't take long, uh, but in addition to um, teaching critical thinking in school, I think there's one dimension uh, that we need to remember that many of the stories that we find in religion, these are myths. Myths in the sense not that these are stories that they were made up, but it conveys a different truth or a different meaning. It's mythos in the French uh, way of looking at it. Uh, and therefore, it is important in the sense that it evokes the imagination and the imaginative spirit uh, based on certain stories that actually convey certain values and principles uh, as how it operates in traditional <laughs> medieval societies. The problem is if we were to see many of these re religious stories in very literal sense, as how a fundamentalist would see it, then that's where we will have a lot of problems. Uh, me as a religious person, I do not see that it is necessarily against my religious belief to accept the uh, evolution as a, a scientific uh, process that is going ongoing. And I accept evolution and it doesn't in any way means that I am rejecting a specific doctrine in religion because I see creation as a mythos, yeah? uh, which even some of my religious uh, 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 friends might even disagree with, but that's the whole spectrum within religious understanding of certain phenomena that we have to accept and not to generalize everything. Yeah? Um, you know, like for example, just now it's mentioned that uh, we don't have anyone or any text to tell us to kill, uh, but the fact is people do kill even though they don't have any religion. So I think we have to accept that fact that in modern society, for instance, the greatest number of casualties and atrocities are done not in the name of religion, but in the name of some ideology. First World War, Second World War, fascism, yeah? and uh, even Pol Pot. Yeah? You look at Southeast Asia itself, highest number of casualties of any of, of the authoritarian regimes in this region are done not in the name of religion, but in the name of some secular ideology. For example, how Suharto, Suharto killed, it's debatable, yeah? more than two million people in the conflict uh, to eliminate uh, communism. That's not, that's not done in the name of religion. Yeah? So, so let's put some things in perspective. That it doesn't matter. People who want to kill will find some form of justification, whether it's in religion or not. I think that's an important point to, to note. Yeah? Now, back to the whole initial question, uh, I think uh, I'm interested to see how religion and atheism can be mutually helpful to each other. In the sense, as a person of religion, atheism can, number one, inform the errors and excesses of bad religion. Of course, religion here, I don't mean religion per se, is it God can be bad, yeah? It's not that. I'm talking about religion has a worldly institution, religious establishment, yeah? And they can be in error. Yeah, for example, Gal Galileo, uh, Galileo's uh, uh, revolt against uh, the church was specifically targeted towards the clergy class who maintain a certain uh, understanding of truth. Yeah, it's not against religion per se in that sense. Um, and secondly, I think atheism can also point to ways of imagining reality that is not readily seen by the theist. Yeah, uh, so these are two ways uh, as person of religion I humbly submit that we can learn from some of the critiques coming from the atheists. As much as also I would like to hear what atheists can learn from, from religion, and I think Tatsi has mentioned some of it. Now, in terms of the public sphere, I think both have a place, uh, as long as both agrees to play by the same, same set of principles and rules of engagement. Now, we have to learn to speak in the language of nation state, and I'm talking primarily towards the theists. We cannot come into the public sphere and talk in the language of theology because theologies differ. But what we can do is to adopt a different set of principles whenever we come to the public sphere to talk about issues of mutual concern. And that is the framework of equal citizenship under the current constitution that we have. I think that is where people of religion and people of no religion can come in the public sphere and debate as equals based on the principle that you are uh, equally a full citizen as I am. And therefore, I will not 
have I, I, I cannot impose my will upon you just like you cannot impose my will upon us but we can discuss what is good for the, uh, the flourishing of, of this common space that we have uh, and therefore I think both religion uh, both theists and non-theists uh, has to uphold freedom of conscience as part of the flourishing of human life and his or her surrounding uh, and freedom of conscience doesn't mean that you only protect freedom of belief it includes freedom not to believe. And this is a problem I think many countries still have. Like in Indonesia, for instance, you can argue for freedom of religion, but can you argue for freedom not to have any religion? Atheism is still uh, illegal in Indonesia, and that's a problem. Yeah? Uh, thankfully, in Singapore, we, we, we are not adopting that kind of framework. Yeah? That to have no religion is not illegal, but we still have a problem that the full inclusiveness of our society is not there yet because you know 80 odd percent of singaporeans profess to have one religion or another right uh, and therefore they have various various mechanisms in order to feedback in order to give inputs into public policies right either closed door in consultation with the government or with ministries or sometimes it's also openly uh, in, in public discourse. But the question, and I'm asking, that people who do not subscribe to any religion, and it's a category, yeah, which uh, recently has been revealed to be 18.3%? 18.5. It, and it's, it's interesting because uh, they are more from the younger, uh, between the age range of 15 to uh, 30, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 24 odd percent profess to have no religion. So this is a trend that is moving in Singapore society. And it's time, I think, public policies need to take seriously the inputs from people who do not subscribe to any religion because they cannot be subsumed under any other categories like class, socioeconomic, uh, uh, um, and, and various other categories that were in place because there are specific concerns of atheists, specific concerns of people of no religion that also needs to inform public policy, especially when it comes to debating issues like 377A. Yep. Am I right? Yep. Why do we have to see religion and no religion has in opposition and that is to be used as a basis for public policy to say I'm not going to repeal because there's a lot of people of religion who's against this. But where is the concern of people of no religion who, whose morality does not hinge upon a specific way of understanding what it means to be moral? There is a different way of understanding morality. I'm not saying that people of no religion have no morals. Yeah, I perfectly believe that people of no religion do have morals, but some of the principles of morality may not uh, be uh, the same as people of religion. In fact, even people of religion itself, there's a whole uh, division within that there are people of religion who support the repeal of 377A. There are people of religion who also oppose repeal of 377A. It's a lot more complex and these voices need to be out there engaging equally as citizens instead of being proscribed, oh, this is a view of people of religion, this view of people no religion, which is a very overgeneralization that cannot be the basis of an inclusive society, especially in terms of public policy. Um, yeah, I guess I'll stop here because I, I would like to hear your comments on that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um